Hello, greetings everyone. Welcome back. On this, uh, well, you guys will see this on a Monday afternoon. Right now it is uh, Friday afternoon as I'm recording this, and it is a cold, cold day, right? It is taking a while for spring to uh, get going here, right? I mean, the sun's been out, but uh, the the, uh, the alarm clock uh, has turned on for uh, the sun, but um, just not getting out of bed quite yet, right? So hopefully by the time you guys see this on Monday, it's uh, acting more like uh, more like spring, right? Got a few things we're getting, you know, getting it's getting a little old, all right, during this time. Nevertheless, we um, forge on here with, uh, you know, I like to say, the king of the social sciences, uh, geography, the introduction to the geography course. And again, we start to look at some things that, um, you know, if you, when you, most people go into this, they're thinking about landforms and, you know, these types of things with geography. We're getting into another section here. It's like, you know, most, most average people would be saying, wow, this, I didn't equate this uh, with uh, geography, but urban geography. We're going to take a look at urban geography. And uh, like I said, we're nearing the end. And if I asked you, and I'm kind of make a prediction here, if I asked you uh, where folks live, let's take uh, some uh, random cities here in the developed world, uh, Amsterdam, Holland, right? Where do they live? Do they live, people live in Amsterdam, do they live down in the central business district, closer to the central business district, or out in the suburbs, right? Uh, London, yeah, same thing. Uh, we'll make a prediction here. We'll get into that. We'll see uh, if your prediction's right. So stop and think about that. Uh, here in the United States, uh, where do people live? You know, live in the cities. Do they live closer to the central business district or do they live out in the suburbs? We'll answer those questions as we um, move along here with uh, today's uh, lesson. Some of the uh, heads up terms. And talk about uh, well. Let's look, look at the objectives first. Where where I want to go uh, with this particular chapter? We want to evaluate the reasons behind the differences in, in American cities and European inner city structures. Kind of give you a clue to maybe uh, where we're going in regard to my opening question, making predictions. We're going to analyze urban land use, all right, another interesting concept, and we're going to explain the multiplier effect. I maybe should have had that first because I'm going to hit there uh, right off the bat, the multiplier effect. <clears throat> the multiplier effect, uh, first heads up term there, multiplier effect, uh, that is added workers in an area and their dependents, all right? And it's made up of two sectors, basic and non-basic sector. The basic sector, these are the folks that bring in money. They're the folks that bring in money to an area. Uh, the non-basic sector, these are the folks that service those people that are, are bringing in the money. Uh, the central place theory, this is where goods and services are produced. I'll introduce you to uh, individual name. We're looking at a lot of names here but with early economic theories and so forth. Uh, Walter Christoller, who explains the logic um, of um, you know, basically the central place theory. Central place theory, the hub of a functional region. And then we're going to take a look at uh, what I think are some cool land use models that are prevalent uh, around the world. The central, the uh, a concentric zone model, the sector model, and the multiple nuclei model. I won't spend time here explaining all those. We'll get into those. I have some visuals in your textbooks that you can look at. Uh, gentrification. This is the idea of refurbishing old homes in the inner city uh, to uh, prop up the land value downtown, right? Make living more um, yeah, palpable. For those uh, living downtown, and then primate cities. Let's talk about primate cities. Primate cities are where you have one city in a country and is twice as big as any other cities 
in that country and it uh, certainly is not the uh, not the US right <clears throat> not gonna dwell on that too long but it, it, it is worth um, uh, taking a peek at so let's take a look at uh, the lecture model here and uh, let me just set up the first section here we start getting we're gonna get into the economic base theory and um, urban settlements urban settlements exist uh, for the efficient performance of functions that are required uh, by the society that uh, that creates them uh, functions that can't be adequately carried out uh, in uh, dispersed locations uh, the many types of urban areas that exist uh, must be located must be located conveniently uh, so they can effectively serve uh, the areas outside of their borders so the situation of a city the situation of a city as its location relative to surrounding areas while the site refers to uh, its exact location remember we took a look at that concept early on maybe back in January or so forth uh, the site uh, we kind of played around with our campus right our, our the site of the campus would have been the address on Glades Pike the um, situation would have been the surrounding area right it's uh, two miles from the turnpike right so uh, economic base theory economic base theory kind of clarifies the functional and locational characteristics of urban areas and distinguishes their roles uh, within the urban system so you have this ratio this ratio of basic to non-basic changes as a city grows in size while the multiplier effect kind of helps explain uh, cycles of urban growth and uh, decline so let's take a look at um, the lecture model white space theory, the economic base theory and again I don't have my, my, my easel anymore so I'm going to do old school here like we uh, used to have to do it uh, you still guys still have one advantage though you can kind of stop this uh, the, uh, the video and uh, make your recordings back in the day you had to keep up with the uh, with the uh, professors but nevertheless here we go the multiplier effect the multiplier effect is where the total population is the same as the added workers who add their dependence to the population the multiplier effect is where the total population is the same as the added workers who add their dependence to the population and this is broken up into two sectors you have your basic sector right these are the folks that are producing the goods or the services that result in uh, the money coming back into that functional region they export activities I remember um, getting my bachelor's degree at Minnesota I uh, lived near a town that housed uh, General Mills right General Mills you guys are all familiar with um, General Mills cereals right very popular cereals like they make lucky charms and uh, tricks right tricks are very popular around here uh, my daughter HJ actually has a t-shirt right of the uh, tricks box me by General Mills so General Mills small town uh, they exported the activities outside uh, of the uh, of the town however the second sector is the non basic sector right uh, they don't really bring money in they don't bring money in to the uh, to the area but they make sure the regions function you know for that particular area there the folks who work at General Mills they didn't have the time to teach their children they didn't have the time to be their own lawyers right or you know, take care of themselves physically to be doctors they needed people to take care of them right so that's your non-basic sector 
right? Again, it could be government officials, school officials, teachers, uh, infrastructure, uh, transportation, doctors, like I said. So you got your multiplier effect, basic sector, non basic sector. Now, looking at your fills here, thus the multiplier effect, the multiplier effect is in essence where a city's population and employment grow when there are more non basic uh, workers and dependents as a supplement, as a supplement to the, not, the, the new basic employment. So therefore, the size of the effect hinges on the community's basic slash uh, non-basic ratio. The more basic sector, the more non-basic sector is going to be needed to support them, right? Providing services. Um, so job creation causes more folks needed from those quaternary sectors that we just looked at, right? The quaternary sectors, one person, one teacher, right? One doctor for each person. Now the quaternary sector, not to go off too far on this, but just applying the last uh, chapter with maybe some current political events that are ongoing right now. Your quaternary sector, that's more your top echelon positions, your government workers, right? Government is the fastest growing sector today. And as I've said in my government class, the only thing they really sell is compassion. And uh, they, you have to pay for that via tax dollars, right? And it's growing fast, that sector. Uh, right now, you have a battle going on underneath the waterline with the coronavirus. Uh, the president's talking about opening up the economy. Uh, you have others that are saying, whoa, let's go, we're going too fast. And that all that may be true. But what you have underneath the waterline, I think, foment, fomenting right now, is a battle between the keenery and quaternary sector. When there's a crisis like this, the longer it goes on, and the longer the quaternary sector, the markets can't get back to work, you're in need of the keenery sector, right? And uh, we don't want to cast any dispersions or any, or on anyone, but it does... Um, allow a lot of power right to the keenery sector and um, we can only hope that um, you know they're calling this right that we're going too too fast uh, maybe opening up the economy and they want to protect everyone they don't, they're not looking to well, we hope they're not looking to um, protect their fiefdoms if you will so anyway you have this uh, you, know, you you kind of see this uh, maybe politically uh, underneath the the waterline at this juncture. So, introduce you guys to a guy named Walter Kristaller. Um, he the central place theory. He posited that back in the early 20th century, and he basically says that the, the uh, and you could turn to page 309 as I set this up to take a look at a um, visual of this. And Walter Gestaller, the central place theory, posits, and you'll see them there on page 309, a set of nodal points from which goods and uh, services are dispensed to a, and you can see them there, a surrounding hexagonal market area or, uh, or hinterland. So the size of the served area is determined by these threshold, if you will, requirements of the um, proffered central place functions. So the hierarchy of centers is marked by a, a you can see them there, a step-like series of size classes with towns of the same uh, class evenly spaced. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, when I talk about those threshold requirements, probably re uh, requires me to explain that a little bit deeper. Talking there about minimum market, right? Minimum market uh, needed to bring about the setting and the selling of a particular good or service, right? Uh, your population, your income uh, is taken. Income levels of the of the uh, of the area are taken into consideration too. Let's take a look at your notes here. This, the central place theory. <clears throat> 
and the central place, the, the, the central place, these are central, central places of the region's economy. These are central places of the region's economy where goods and services are distributed to the regions, right? These are, they are central places of the region's economy where goods and services are distributed to the regions. I'm going to next start developing the central place theory into what is well developed around the globe into some models of how land use is constructed uh, with the central place and the surrounding regions. And you can turn to, as I set this up, turn to page 315. Page 315, and it gives you some uh, illustrations there of the uh, major land models, land use models. <clears throat> land use characteristics within the central cities reflect differential accessibility, uh, market competition, individual locational preferences, and uh, modifying influence of government controls. In some urban areas, you have mass transit systems uh, imparted to the settlement, a repetitive uh, functional area pattern of uh, land use summarized by classical land use and growth models, as you can see there on page 315. So the social geography of urban areas also displays regularities in the tendency of its residents to segregate themselves into population areas uh, based on social status, uh, stage and life cycle, and uh, ethnicity. Let's take a look at that first ring, the concentric zone model. The concentric zone model. The concentric zone model, you can see there are five zones emanating outward from the central business district, or we're going to call it the CBD. So this, the first ring there, you can see the number one there, that's your central business district. The second ring with the concentric zone model is characterized by high population density and slums. The third ring comprises the labor force that are lower to middle class with smaller homes. The outer fourth and fifth rings are constituted by the upper classes and middle class. You have nicer homes and apartments there. <clears throat> Pardon me. So this zone, the concentric zone model, this uh, zone is dynamic in the use of land and the movement according to income level, right? As you gain an income, uh, you move. Uh, you can move farther out um, from the uh, from the central business district if you wish. Let's take a look at the sector model. The sector model. Sector model here. You have higher rate residential areas that move outward from the cent center of the city along transportation routes, like commuter rail lines, for instance, or probably. So as the city expands, you have new housing for the city that's needed. And this sector is also dynamic. As older areas are abandoned uh, in place of outward movement, the uh, vacated areas are then inhabited by lower income populations. <clears throat> Your uh, authors provide some uh, illustrations that are breaking the sector model down. Generally, the concentric zone model is the order of the day here in North America for your cities. But uh, Chicago is um, constructed on the sector model. So is Calgary, Alberta. And you can see in your own time the keys of where different classes are, are um, kind of congregate. Uh, in those models, right? 
Uh, we already talked about that with the concentric zone model. Now the third and final, you know, um, familiar model um, would be the uh, multiple nuclei model. And this one here is, uh, you know, the sector model and uh, the concentric zone model have some familiarities, right? There's, there's some differences, but uh, there's a lot of things are in concert with each other. Not so much with the multiple nuclei model. The multiple nu nuclei model, this model here, um, contradicts the first two models, right? Contradicts um, the first two models. The uh, This model states that the urban centers are developed by the periphery, right? Not necessarily the central business district. Spreading from various nodes of growth, not just the CBD. So the activities are relegated to particular places in connection to their functions. Could be retail districts. I mean, retail districts need accessibility. Could be a port area. Ports uh, need uh, waterfronts. take that a little further here. Let's take a look at the, the growth of the cities and suburbs. Uh, many suburbanites uh, have little contact with the central di central city that uh, spawn the suburbs. Uh, gentrification, right? Gentrification is responsible for uh, a modest uh, revitalization of some inner city neighborhoods, but uh, urban sprawl still continues here in North America especially in the United States, kind of un unabated. Let's break this down. Uh, you look at your fills there, the suburbs and the social status. Even though there are revitalization products of old homes and neighborhoods in the inner city, folks in the suburbs generally here in, in the United States have little contact with the central city. Right, and some of you guys did some papers on this. We just have a lot more crime in our central cities than do other, even North Americans, even Canadian cities. Right, certainly more crime than um, certainly in the past European cities. That's been, uh, I think, it's been elevated somewhat in the last ten years or so. Now the older city. The older city and its growth was absorbed here by the suburbs. It was absorbed by the suburbs. So with that, the tax base, the tax base and places of employment also went out to the suburbs. Now what it did was it afforded many the opportunity for an exodus uh, to the suburbs further segregating the ethnic groups and, and classes. And I think it's probably lead to a good discussion question later on uh, in this um, particular chapter. Right? I'll probably submit that to you guys. You know, how do you account for the way ethnic groups tend to splinter off? I mean, is that natural or is it, you know, human weakness? I have page 406 down here for some reason. And um, don't know why. I'll forget that for now. Come back to that in case I need that. Let's take a look at social status in the city hierarchy. And you have some white space there. Social status, you can, you can kind of. Um, springboarding off you know, what I just talked about, social status is basically determined, determined by income, right? Income, uh, your education, uh, employment, and the value of one's home. So here in the United States, a good income, college education, professional level position and type of home can um, frame one's uh, one's social status. 
a good housing is uh, an indicator. A good housing indicator. Let me just put it this way. How am I going to say this? A good housing indicator would be how many people per room live in your house, right? The more, the less people, that is a good housing indicator, which would probably be an indicator of your income level, your education, right? So a good social status, a good social status means here in North America, living, you know, how, how far does one live away from the central business district, from the center city? Farther you live out, probably an indicator of good, you know, good housing indicator, good incomes. Again, is this a, you know, getting back to one of our earlier subjects, you know, is this a culture trait, a culture complex, right? Do you have to live um, out far from the, out, out, um, as far as ways possible from the central business district without going too far into the rural areas and defeating your transportation costs to get to work? So urbanization, urbanization is progressing at a rapid pace especially in the third world. We've looked at that, some alarming rates, right? Uh, most developing countries and developed countries would be United States, Canada, the West, developing countries, you know, second, third world countries. Uh, most of your developing countries have a primate city uh, where much of the country's commerce and industry takes place. Uh, and these cities contrast markedly uh, with those in developed countries, uh, especially in regard to the size and extent of slums. Let's take a look at urbanization in the third world. Now, some note taking here. Um, primate cities. When we talk about primate cities, primate cities are cities that are at least twice the size of the second ranked city in the country. In fact, there may not be a second city. There may not be a second city. Now, it may have smaller, immediate sized cities. I'm thinking, um, example, this would be Seoul, South Korea, right? Primate city, fairly uh, populated country, South Korea. Uh, some several smaller, immediate sized cities, but none that they get close to uh, the size of Seoul. So these capital cities, these capital cities are a result of being former colonies, right, where your um, economic and political activity was concentrated in one, at one central point. Therefore, uh, population growth is uh, as a result, manifested itself disproportionately. Um, so the size of the capital city uh, further encourages you know, more growth. That's where the jobs are. So you're not, you know, you're exacerbating the uh, population base, you know, of the primate city. Lastly, I want to talk about, this is one of the more interesting concepts in, again, a very interesting course, and it's how metropolitan areas, metropolitan areas of the world have distinct patterns of land use and can be differentiated on the basis of region, uh, historical factors, age of the city, uh, transportation systems, and the ethnic and economic status of their uh, of their residents. And you could turn to page, I know this is right here, 327, 328. See what happens here is you have, uh, we have every other year, a different book for the same subject. And um, you know, I have my notes based off of, you know, whatever set year. And that's why I've become keen when the uh, publishers um, contact me about a new book. I'm always keen about um, 
you know, do I want to change my book? But the geography, you got to be careful because um, things do change. You want to say, you want to look at the new books, something like U.S. History 1, eh, not that much changing. Probably just an excuse for the publishers to, well, you know what that's an excuse to do. They might change a paragraph or, or something or a picture, but so, um, nevertheless, I certainly digress. Now, take a look here at Canadian cities, right? We'll start here in um, North America. Um, the Canadian city, the Canadian city does not take up as much space as an American city does. One will see more skyscrapers and people, but less suburbanization less suburbanization again we have suburbs here because we have more crime in our inner cities the norm for canadians is the multiple family housing units in the city and the idea here is that saves space where there's just as many people in the city area canadian cities are not as there are canadian cities are more dependent on mass transportation uh, than its uh, U.S. counterparts. And I would say this too, and we've looked at this, we looked at um, some of the subsets of culture. And one of the subsets of American culture is ideological subset, you know, a belief of how the country should be. And we like our freedom here, right? We were born on that. We were born on freedom, fighting for our freedom, and the liberty, right, a car gives us, right? So it, um, although there's crime, we like the liberty, we like the open spaces, and uh, maybe living a little bit farther out from where the uh, where the agglomeration is. But um, Canadians, uh, Canadian residents, uh, you know, a little more dependent on mass transportation. Um, Canadians also, as a result of not having the urban sprawl do not have half as the um, half as much as the expressway miles as uh, the United States does Canadians have a higher proportion of folks that are foreign born uh, Toronto uh, uh, ethnic hub uh, there are some concerns in Canada about uh, the low low birth rate there amongst the natives and um, you know, Toronto is bringing in a lot of uh, different ethnic groups, Vancouver, a lot of folks from Asia, and some in Canada are being concerned about Canadian culture, Canadian Anglo culture uh, getting swallowed up. Uh, there's been also less flight to the suburbs by Canadians, thus less distinction between the uh, classes and the races. The income for residents in the cities is therefore higher than it is in the United States. Right, income for residents in the United States, the inner city rings, not very high, right? We said it's slums, lower income. Uh, in Canadian cities, as we're gonna take a look at here, the uh, European cities, folks are congregating uh, there's less crime. People want to get close, be closer to work. So your higher income levels tend to, tend to remain closer to uh, the central business district. So the job creating entities are still within the city confines. And you can take a look at page uh, 328, uh, high density Canadian cities, right? Downtown peninsula of Vancouver. Right, of Vancouver out on the west coast. You can take a look at that uh, caption on your own and read the inset there on the Canadian city. There's a time we won't do that here. West European cities. Uh, look at uh, three. Let's see where I want to go here. Let's look at 327. 327. H327. West European cities. West European cities are structured thus as irregular uh, system of narrow streets. Uh, most of those residing there live in apartments. Suburbia, again, is generally absent 
in West Europe. Uh, the homes are more closely spaced uh, since cars are not as much in need. Uh, my wife grew up in Holland. She could tell you all about that. Uh, uh, they didn't need cars, right? Uh, they didn't have a car that they came over here to the States. She didn't have a car that she came over here to the States. I grew up, um, you know, uh, bikes. I mean, basically, a lot of a lot of Europeans in Amsterdam, where she lived, uh, went about on bikes. But uh, they lived, you know, close to the Central Business District. So, um, again, you know, West European cities do not have the inner city deterioration that uh, Americans do. It's kind of embarrassing, really, when you think about all this crime, um, the deterioration. Uh, the inner cities tend to attract a wealthier, more educated class in, uh, in uh, certainly Western Europe. Now, Eastern European cities, a little different, interesting wrinkle. East Europe was former communist, right? Up, up through 1991. So East European cities depend on public transportation, much like their Western counterparts do. Where it differs is in how they are still controlled uh, by you know government entities. So, uh, so in light of this, um, they were set up for administrative and cultural buildings back in the old communist days, right? And uh, communists weren't capitalists, so you didn't have the the skyscrapers, you know, and you had administrative buildings, you know. Communist officials were determining, you know, what gets produced, how much of it, and for whom, right? So today, uh, you still have, you know, a lot of the administrative buildings. You don't have communism there, but you still have, you know, a lot of administrative functions in Eastern Europe, you know, socialist, capitalist, socialist governments. So, kind of wrap this up today, and uh, by this point you'll have your graphic organizer if you want to get those out. Let's take a look where we were at today, talk about where we're going. Uh, urban geography, we looked at the multiplier effect, all right? New basic employment plus non-basic employment, the service new basic employment. One laborer equals one teacher, one doctor, right? Central place theory, right? Central place theory uh, of a region's economy. Uh, goods and services are distributed to outlying areas of the region, right? Walter Kristaller, uh, his um, theory as a uh, concept. Uh, land use, all right, land use models. You have your concentric zone model, uh, five zones emanating outward from the CBD, right? Uh, second ring, high population density in slums. Third ring, smaller homes. Uh, labor force, middle class, and then uh, movement, you know, your fourth and fifth rings, your nicer homes, apartments, upper middle classes, and it's dynamic, right? Movement is according to your income. Make more income, you can, you have the freedom to do that. Very similar to the sector model, a higher rate residential area moves out from the central business district along transportation routes, kind of a fairly dynamic not as much with the multiple nuclei model. Um, city could spread out there to various nodes of growth, right? Retail districts, ports, airport, right? Uh, multiple nuclei model. Uh, urban centers developed, uh, you know, as a result by perhaps the periphery, retail district, ports, airports. Then your suburbs, suburbs and social status, right? Older city. And tax base got lost, um, so there was a segregation of, of class and race uh, determined by your social status, right? Education, employment, uh, value of your home, people per home, and distance from the center city. And then urbanization, you have your American cities. Yeah, your American cities, we look take a look at there, pardon me. Uh, your Canadian city does not take up as much space. Uh, less suburbanization, uh, multiple family housing units, uh, higher incomes for residents, uh, more dependent on mass transportation, less expressway miles, not as much deterioration. West European cities, a regular system of narrow streets, uh, apartment living, wealthy, educated classes are attracted, uh, little by way of suburbia, not as much needed for cars, I'm going to sneeze, 
<coughs> pardon me. <coughs> they usually come in fours with me, so. Less expressway miles are not as much needed for cars. A homes closely spaced, no inner city deterioration. East European cities, former communist bloc countries. Three. There we go. Depend on public transportation, controlled by government instead of public, a private sector. A little bit different from the Western European cities, but again, not, doesn't have the inner city deterioration. You're, you know, wealthier. Uh, more educated, live close to work. So that's uh, kind of a recap of uh, today's lesson. Now on your um, course page there, you'll see a sum it up sheet, right? A sum it up sheet. Um, get that to me by the end of um, class today. I'll keep the windows open till five o'clock and uh, you'll have a lab. Uh, ready to go for until um, we do a week from where you guys are at on a Monday. And then I'm going to post, I have posted, I'm going to do that in a few minutes here, by the time you guys see it on Monday, um, a study guide for the final, right? That's coming up. That's uh, now uh, kind of looming over the horizon, right? May 4th, somewhere around there. And... Um, Basically, you'll see there that the you know, part one, just telling you the final is going to consist of approximately 30 to 40 true-false multiple-choice items from your quizzes. So the, hopefully you've not been, and I've said this before, hopefully you're not throwing your quizzes out. So these items we pull right from past quizzes. And then I have some other items to study for a short answer section, right? You'll see those. And then the essays, right? Uh, the essays will be as follows. Um, you will, um, you know, choose, uh, I have uh, five options there, and I'm going to have you choose three of them, right, and, um, and you can see some of the other vital stats there that go along with completing those in a um, fashion that uh, pleases me, right? So, there you have it, you guys uh, need to, uh, any questions? Outside of Sundays, I'm looking at the, my uh, laptop uh, throughout the day. You can uh, always contact me, of course, and I'll get back to you as uh, rapidly as I can. And um, and I think that's it, right? So, um, again, you guys have a good week. Stay well and safe, and um, I will um, talk to you down the line. All right, bye-bye.